thank you very much. So I'm going uh, I it's what a shame you can't see the beautiful view over the Pacific Ocean that I'm looking at. But there we are. That's technology. Um, so it's a real honour and pleasure to speak to you today, and I'm hoping you're seeing my first slide. Um, and um, the uh, there's lots of things going on at the moment in healthcare. Um, we're seeing lots of changes happen around us. Um, and that's partly because of the changes in pressures, the changes in our, our workload, the changes in the clinical conditions that we're dealing with. Um, so I thought I'd start by setting out the scale of the challenges that we're facing um, in the National Health Service in England, uh, the size of those issues, how we're starting to deal with them, and how we are adapting our training and education processes naturally to allow us to deal with the new world and the new challenges that we're facing. So if I could have the second slide up, please. So I thought I would give you an idea of the size of NHS England and what we do. So we serve just over 54 million people and have an annual budget of around 110 billion pounds. <laughs> over 150 acute hospital trusts we serve with just under 8,000 general practices and primary care facilities. When the NHS was founded in 1948, since then, the life expectancy of the British population has risen by over 15 years, so that men can expect to live almost 80 years now and women 82 years. We are the fifth largest employer on the planet with 1.3 million employees that we not only have to uh, uh, train but keep maintained in their skills through their careers. Um, and every 36 hours, the National Health Service in England sees another 1 million patients 75 million outpatients, 23 million emergency room visits. You can tell I've just been giving this talk in America, and 16 million inpatient, uh, sorry, uh, inpatient uh, episodes per year. Now people look at that and say that is an enormous system. It is the largest unified healthcare system in the history of our planet. How on earth can you be innovative within such an enormous system? How on earth can you take it and create change? And it is exactly because it is so large that I say if you want to innovate at scale anywhere on the planet, the NHS is the place to do it. The opportunities we have there, if we can get it right, I realise are truly immense. However, if I can have the next slide up, please. We have a number of challenges that we face. When we started our health service in 1948, we had to deal, I don't need to tell your society, with a number of acute conditions that people lived into their 50s or 60s and then died quite suddenly with, whether that was a, uh, a heart attack or a stroke or cancer or an infectious disease. But now those acute diseases we've made such great inroads into. We vaccinate, we have advanced pharmacology and stenting, we thrombolize, we extract clots. Um, uh, we have advanced chemo radiotherapy regimes. So we now spend approximately 70% of our budget on the NHS in England on the management of chronic disease. And yet we have a system that was designed around acute care and around our hospitals. So does that system that served us so well when we founded it in 1948 serve us as well today? So two years ago, the NHS came out with its vision, its five year forward view of how we would tackle these uh, challenges we face. Next slide, please. So the three key challenges are, are commonly known as the triple aim, better health, better care, and delivered more efficiently across the system. So no longer can we uh, just have a sickness service. We need to have a wellness service. We need to get serious about prevention. So the NHS in England have announced a number of things. We're working with our colleagues in Public Health England to look at how we can transform the system, use our purchasing power, use other levers that we have to try and change behaviour on prevention. Um, we have also int are introducing a sugar tax on soft drinks, which some people may have seen, and a variety of other things. But the situation in England at the moment is 20% of our population smoke, a third of people drink too much alcohol, and two-thirds of people are either overweight or obese. Now, these are all lifestyle issues that are entirely preventable. So we've recognised that and we're doing some very uh, uh, sort of strong and direct things about that. We're being very straight speaking about that with the population because we need to address it. 
around the care and quality gap, the new models of care, we are totally redesigning our health service. We're looking at the way we can keep people in their homes and in their residential homes that can be made smart so they can live healthier, happier, longer, independent lives. We're reimagining our primary, secondary and social care services, bringing them more together like accountable care organisations so that we can join services up between all of those. We're reimagining and redesigning our emergency care pathways as we look to sort that out right across our country. And then, of course, on the funding gap, we've identified a 30 pound um, shortfall by 2020 that we have to make up. Now, the UK government are helping with some of that, but if we carry on doing more of the same, whether that's in healthcare or that's in the way we train our staff to take forward, we're not going to meet our financial targets. To so we have to do something disruptive. We have to do something new. Next slide, please. So while all that's happening, and you will recognise that from across many countries, it's not just unique to England, the challenges we face. This has come along, what I call the personalised, empowered health and care revolution. Now, we know increasingly that many of the things that are disrupting our lives aren't coming straight out of our universities or our hospitals. Um, they're coming out of companies more and more and they're delivering these services direct to patients and they're becoming personalised. So this one size fits all approach that we've had for so long, particularly in medicine, no longer is going to work for the future. Now personalisation is not just genomics, it is all eomics, your proteomics, metabolomics, your microbiomics, which is a rapidly expanding field, but it's all the technology that can be personalised along that. How can we take the data analytics and advanced intelligence that is out there and use that to personalise a health and care service for you. Digital and M health platforms, all the advanced technologies that are out there. But of course, social networking is vital. If you look at the skills that organisations like Facebook have in taking large data sets and then segmenting the population, they segment them into categories that people want, might, have bought, might want to buy things. Could we segment them into risk strategies, uh, uh, you know, where their risks are? Could we therefore target where best services can be delivered to our population? And we have to move away from this sick care model, this patient-centred model, to a people-centred model. We need healthy people and our patients who are sick at the heart of the way we redesign this. So all this is going along, alongside the five-year forward view and, and the challenges we face. So next slide, please. So you know, should now be seeing a quote from John Maynard Keynes, the uh, economist, the British economist, who in 1935 summed up quite nicely one of the grand challenges we face. So the difficulty does not lie in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones, which, as most of us have been, into every corner of our minds. Now, for me as a surgeon, that is medical custom and practice. I was brought up, it was an apprenticeship really in that way, and that is so ingrained to our behaviour. So there are all these great things. You will have seen many new technologies, new platforms, new uh, ways of analysing data and looking at them. But actually we have to stop doing some of the things that once served us well, but now no longer serve us as well as we did. So we have to win hearts and minds if we're going to change this. So I thought I would show you an example of uh, custom and practice and what's happened um, when we don't change that. It changes itself ultimately. So next slide please. So hopefully you're looking at the slide that says the evolution of the doctor's bag. And I was stunned when I looked into this. 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt we had the hieroglyphics and the first doctor's bag and doctor's instruments ever demonstrated. Scrapers, cutters, graspers, gougers, all those sorts of things. And then when I was looking through Arabic texts uh, from the Middle Ages, 500 years ago, the picture next to that, almost identical. Medi four and a half thousand years and medical practice has hardly changed a bit. And then in the top right from the Welcome Collection, a picture of a doctor's bag from 100 years ago, 1920. And we've added a stethoscope and a sphygmomanometer, which had both been invented by that stage. But other than that, it still hasn't changed. And then coming up to the year 2000, still a very analogue doctor's bag. We've added disposable gloves and some alcohol gel, but beyond that, still the same core instruments. So in nearly 5,000 years, medicine until very recently hadn't changed. Next slide, please. 
So what I hope you're seeing now is my view of what's disrupting that, and it's the digital patient kit. More technology is displayed on this slide than is available in most primary care centres and, in fact, in many other medical units. This is available directly to our patients now. So technology companies and others have disrupted the market and now these services are being offered direct to our patients. Now, one of the beauties of my job at NHS England, because we are the largest healthcare um, unified healthcare service on the planet is that the world beats its way to our door to show us their latest greatest things and in the last two years I've probably had over a thousand pitches from different companies telling us about those things now because of time um, and I think I'm nearly out of it um, so I'll, I won't pick all of these, but we'll be happy to discuss any of them with you. But because you're, um, and whether it's the plugins or the wearable sensors or other things, but one I will pick that stands out as you are a cardiology society is Cordio, which is uh, listed just down there in the bottom left in the platforms. This is an app that has come out of Israel that monitors changes in tone of your voice, running, and it runs in the background on your mobile phone all the time. They have used this technology to in uh, congestive heart failure patients and they can predict an admission with heart failure 10 days in advance of it happening by a change in the tone of your voice on your mobile phone. So you could ring your mum up in the morning, she says she's feeling fine and the app on your mobile phone says tell her to take 20 milligrams more of frusamide. It is absolutely stunning. And I could talk for 20 minutes on all the other things, but there are, there are some amazing things on that slide. Next slide, please. And the question comes, all this is coming along, but how are we training our clinicians? Name one university on our planet that is training our clinicians to deliver this personalized, empowered health and care revolution. Well, I can't find one, and we couldn't find one at NHS England. So... Around a year ago, uh, next slide please, so you should have the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme at the top there. I pitched to Sir Bruce Keogh, our National Medical Director, that actually we needed to recognise this and we needed to embrace it. That um, we needed to look at how we could equip our clinicians in our country with the skills, with the knowledge, with the experience that could be gained from the entrepreneurial, the startup, the commercial world to give them those skills, not just to be entrepreneurs, but to be intrapreneurs. So, although they may want to set up a business and spin it out, actually, they may just want to use those skills, that knowledge, that experience gained from the commercial sector to bring that to the benefit of healthcare so we could change the way we adopt things, our pathways, our processes within healthcare so we could have a real disruption, a sea change in the way we practice healthcare. So, uh, Sir Bruce was very supportive and said um, that you have no money um, to do it, go out. So here we are one year down the line and we've just announced um, we've appointed 103 clinical entrepreneurs in our first year, and that means it's the largest entrepreneurial training program um, the planet has ever seen. And we offer them a series of mentoring and coaching. They all get a commercial mentor. We give them opportunities within their training program for less than full-time training. We've arranged a number of advanced internships with global corporates, but also with startups and, and other uh, public sector organizations. We connect them to customers within the health service who need the solutions that they can help provide. And also we connect them to funding opportunities. And we have arranged a whole series of education and networking events, because when you put the the young doctors together it is quite astounding what can happen never before has a country incubated a whole cohort of its brightest young entrepreneurial spirits in one place and it's it's like a, a firework display going off when they all get together it is quite amazing and we've set up eight what we call pit stop sessions across the year where they come in on a daily on a, a basis just for a day and we train them on these eight sessions throughout the year a number of keynote lectures some self-learning sets um, and uh, working on their lean business canvases and personal development plans to take their ideas forward before they go back out into the national health service for another sort of hundred laps of the track before they come back in so this has been an incredible success. What we found is that um, uh, we were facing 5% of junior doctors per year permanently leaving the NHS in England and about 50% of doctors when they finished their second foundation year after qualifying were taking a break and many of them not coming back. 
Well, in the first year of the Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, we've moved from a brain drain to a brain gain position where 15% of the people who were appointed have come back into healthcare because now they can pursue their dual passions of being an entrepreneur and delivering healthcare to our population. So, in the first year, it's junior doctors, but in the second year, which we're just about to launch, we are going to all clinical um, providers of healthcare in our country. That's nurses, allied health practitioners, uh, pharmacists, clinical scientists are all included, and we'll be opening applications up for that in November. And then the following year, we plan to open it up to patients and citizens. Why do we think that all the latest, greatest ideas are going to come from our, uh, our medical profession? They may not come from there at all. And if, in fact, you look at industry, the most disruptive things come from outside that industry to disrupt it and take it forward. You know, Uber didn't come from the taxi industry or the car industry and so many other things that have come from outside. Amazon wasn't a high street chain of shops that suddenly developed the largest shop on the planet. So we need to include these people from outside. So that's what we're doing and that's what we're training. And the last slide is just the um, a link to the Clinical Entrepreneur Program, which you'd be welcome to go and, and look at and see what you think. And I'd be um, delighted if there are any questions. Sorry, I think I've overrun very slightly. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's it.